In this episode, we talk about a major decline in Uttarakhand's fruit production. We also talk about the CBI arresting one of the alleged kingpins of the neat UG paper leak case. But first, we talk about two activists being put into preventive detention in Arunachal Pradesh. Hi, I am Niharika Nanda, and you are listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. The Upper Siang project is a proposed 11,000 megawatt hydropower project on the Siang River in the Upper Siang district of Arunachal Pradesh. First initiated back in 2017, the dam is said to have strategic importance. However, the dam is facing opposition from the locals and from members of three anti-dam organizations: the Siang Indigenous Farmers Forum, the Bang Resistance, and North East Human Rights. As a part of this opposition, two activists who wanted to reach out to Union Power Minister Manohar Lal Khattar during his visit to the state were put in preventive detention on the grounds that they were likely to attempt to cause a public order issue. To understand the strategic importance of the project and why locals are so against it, we have Indian Express's Sukrita Barua joining us. Sukrita, can you begin by telling us what is the Upper Siang Storage Project? So the Upper Siang multi-purpose storage project is a proposed hydropower project. It's not been constructed yet. It's proposed to be this eleven thousand megawatt hydropower project, which would make it the largest such project in India. And it's proposed to be built on the Siang River, which is in Arunachal Pradesh. Now the Siang River is the same river which ultimately becomes the Brahmaputra further downstream. So it begins as Sangpo in Tibet, and it flows for more than thousand kilometers in Tibet, and then it enters the same river enters India from a place called Geling in Arunachal Pradesh, and that's when it becomes the Siang. And then once it flows further down in Assam, this becomes the Brahmaputra. So this is the river on which this project is uh, proposed to be made. and the project is said to have strategic importance can you tell us a bit about that though you know has this proposed capacity of 11000 megawatt but uh, officials repeatedly point out that its hydropower potential is a by product actually and the major thrust that is made when proposing this dam and talking about this dam is its stated strategic importance so like i said this river begins in tibet flows for a considerable length there and then enters india so china is uh, you know uh, reported to be working on a number of dams and hydropower projects in the tibet region and the largest of this is actually a 60000 megawatt project so this upper siang project is projected as being a counter to that so that uh, proposed 60000 megawatt dam in tibet is not only supposed to produce a huge amount of hydropower for china but also it's supposed to be diverting water the water of the sangpo towards north china which is water scarce now what that is believe that what is fear that will be the consequence of that is that the flow into india will be decreased so this upper siang project is supposed to function as kind of a reservoir so if the flow decreases then you know it can counter that effect so that is why this project is projected and touted as one of relevance to national security and as a strategic project And Sukrita, can you tell us why is the project facing so much opposition from the locals? So, since its proposal in two thousand seventeen, the tribe which uh, lives in the area that is likely to be affected by this dam is the majority Adi tribe. The Adi is like the majority tribe in Arunachal Pradesh, and activists and local farmers there have repeatedly been voicing their concern that if this is built, then uh, more than three hundred villages will be affected. They will effectively be submerged by this process. And amongst the things that will be affected are actually the district headquarters of Upper Siang, which is Yingkiong. So that is something that you know has repeatedly been voiced by activists. They have been resisting. So this uh, dam is supposed to be developed by the NHPC, and efforts have been underway to try and conduct preliminary surveys to get the ball rolling. But those have been stalled for a long time. Those are you know taking a uh, longer than they would have liked to. because of resistance by locals in fact presently the nhpc and the district administrations and the state government are trying to convince the people of the region to allow them to conduct what is called a pre feasibility survey 
because the NHPC has identified three sites in this area and they intend to carry out pre-feasibility surveys in all three of these locations to finalize the final location of the dam. So they're trying to convince the local population to allow them to conduct these surveys, but the people are still resisting it. And, uh, you know, this is an ongoing resistance at the moment. And Sukrata, have similar projects been proposed in the past and what reaction did they prompt from the locals? So, see, this particular project, this 11,000 megawatt project was first proposed in 2017 by the Niti Aayog. But before that also, there has been a number of projects. In, in fact, this project is supposed to replace two projects. There was supposed to be an Upper Siang Stage 1 project and an Upper Siang Stage 2 project, two separate dams. And what has been proposed is to integrate both of these in one location. And since the 1980s, you know, there's been a push for dams in Arunachal Pradesh to harness the hydropower or potential of the rivers here. And since then, there has been a long history, actually, of resistance by the local tribal communities there against this kind of dam building. And this particular dam is no exception to that. And we understand that two activists belonging to the Siang Indigenous Farmers Forum wanted to reach out to Union Power Minister Manoharlal Khattar during his visit to the state but were prevented from doing that. Can you tell us what happened? So, earlier this week, on Monday, the new Union Power Minister Manohar Lal Khattar had visited Arunachal Pradesh. It was his first state visit as Union Power Minister here. And he was in the state with the purpose of discussing the hydroelectric projects in the state with the state government. Ahead of his visit, the Itanagar police summoned and uh, detained two prominent anti-dam activists, Ibo Mili and Duge Apang. And uh, what the police said is that, you know, they had received reports that the duo are likely to create a law and order situation or a public order issue. So they were called and they were detained during the period of the minister's visit and they were made to sign a bond pledging that they will not engage in any such activity for the next year or so. So what these activists and their fellow activists have been saying is that what they actually wanted to do was hand over a memorandum to the power minister, you know, reiterating their concerns and of course voicing their concerns to the new minister, you know, highlighting the same concerns that I've spoken about before. Along with, say, the question of the way local communities will be affected, they have also been raising the ecological concerns because Arunachal Pradesh is a biodiversity hotspot. And they've also been saying that, you know, not only will local communities be affected, their way of life will be affected and the ecology will be affected. So these are the concerns that they wanted to present to the Union Prime Minister. You also had the opportunity of talking to the SIFF president. What did he have to say about this? So he said the same thing that I told you. I had spoken to Gegong Jijong, who's the president of the SIFF. And he is a resident of Gete village, which is also among the villages which will be affected by the dam. And he's been saying that, you know, they've been resisting the dam and that they do not intend to allow any survey to happen. Because what he said is that since we don't consent to the dam, why would we consent to a survey? It makes no sense. That's what he was saying. And he was saying that if the dam is built and if, you know, our village is submerged along with that, our farmlands will be submerged. And his question was, where do we go? He said that if we move further uphill, then there's snow and ice and we won't be able to cultivate there. So our uh, livelihood and our way of living will be completely disrupted. So the same concerns that I mentioned earlier were reiterated by him. And Sukrita, did the resistance by the locals prompt any political reactions or reactions from the project authorities? The attempts by the state government and the NHPC to get the ball rolling have been stalled considerably because of the resistance by the people. So the state government, NHPC and the district administration have been trying to conduct these public awareness programs and, you know, try and tell them that, you know, these surveys are going to happen. Please cooperate with us. So these kind of meetings have been taking place this year. And, uh, you know, the apprehensions raised by the people are uh, politically acknowledged. This year, Arunachal Pradesh has had two major elections. They had their uh, assembly elections and the Lok Sabha elections. And while campaigning in this region, Chief Minister Pema Khandu had said that, you know, we acknowledge the concerns and uh, the dam will only be built with the consent of the people. But, you know, even after he said this, there's been this, you know, renewed kind of push and renewed efforts by, not renewed, but, uh, you know, we're seeing an acceleration in the push to begin the pre-construction activities. 
and along with this kind of you know public awareness meetings as the district administration calls it there's also another parallel thing that is happening is that the nhpc is intending to pump in a lot of money into this area which is also a part of public outreach so it has finalized a rupees 325 crore package to you know introduce livelihood schemes and to upgrade and build new health and education and sports infrastructure in this area and these mous are being signed between the nhpc and the state government which is also you know a part of making the mood of the people more amenable to enabling this dam to be built here to try and win them over to this next we talk about a decline in the fruit production in uttarakhand uttarakhand has been a major source of premium quality fruit in india nainital's ramnagar and ramgarh district are known as the fruit bowl of uttarakhand But over the last couple of years the fruit production in the state has seen a major decline both in quality and quantity. This has caused farmers who have been cultivating these fruits since generations to rethink their choices. To understand why the state is facing this decline in the fruit production and what the experts have to say about it, we have Indian Express's Avnish Mishra joining us. Avnish, can you begin by telling us what are the fruits that are regularly grown in Uttarakhand? Yeah, Uttarakhand has been a leading producer of premium fruits like pear, peach, plum, and apricot, and it has also been the third largest producer of high quality apples in the country. Other than that, in the plain areas of Uttarakhand, the farmers are also growing mango and lychee, but it has always been known for premium fruits. However, in the last like seven years, there is a decline in yield and area under cultivation of major fruits, and that. difference has been more prominent since 2020 and this dip is particularly remarkable for temperature fruits as compared to their uh, tropical counterparts and as you mentioned that there has been seen a decline in the fruit production in uttarakhand in the last couple of years can you tell us more about that yeah as i mentioned like in the last 6 or 7 years there has been a decline both uh, in the area under cultivation and the crop yield at the same time and if we look at the numbers then the total area under fruit cultivation was around 1.77 lakh hectares in 2016-17 which has reduced by around 54% to reach 81000 hectares in 22-23 and at the same time the total yield of fruits has reduced from 6.62 lakh metric ton in 1617 to 3.69 lakh metric ton in 22 and 23 which is around 44% decline and in terms of fruits the change in area under cultivation and change in the yield has also been in negative if we talk about pear apricot plum walnut apple and other fruits they have seen a decline ranging from 71% to around 55% in terms of change in area under cultivation and from 7 24 to around 52 to 30 percent in uh, change in uh, percentage yield, and if we talk about like specifically Nani Tal, where I recently went to talk to the farmers, we have seen that in Nani Tal in 1617, the productivity of all the fruits was around 10 metric ton per hectare, which has dropped to around 8.96 metric ton in 22 and 23, which is around 11 percent drop. So yeah, like we can say that across the state, both the area under cultivation. and the productivity of the fruit is also declining so we saw that this year many states in india faced heat wave conditions how did that impact the fruit production yeah there is no denying that the climate is rapidly changing like in the last decade or something and if we talk about uttarakhand specifically then like uh, as per some studies uh, the temperatures in uttarakhand have increased by nearly 1.5 degrees from like 1970 to 2022 and because of that there is a change in weather patterns and the decrease in rainfall also there has been a significant negative trend of minus 2.23% since 1900s which is a very big deal and if we look at this year itself then before the monsoon arrived there was no rain in uttarakhand since like last november or december which is very unprecedented because even before monsoons there used to be some snowfall and rain in the like uh, months leading to the monsoon so because of that the weather patterns are changing and that is causing a significant heat wave in the areas which were earlier not that much hot so like the plains are affected obviously the temperatures are rising but at the same time the hill areas are also witnessing less and less snowfall which is very unprecedented for a state like uttarakhand 
as I earlier mentioned that Uttarakhand is known for the premium quality fruits like the peach, apricot, plum and apples. So these are the fruits which are generally grown on higher altitude because they need a lower temperature. They also require snowfall and because there is less and less snowfall in the last few years and that is significantly affecting the fruit yield which we can see reflected in the numbers. And Avnish, what are some of the other reasons behind this decline in production? If we see, then we can say that all the reasons are mostly generated by the climate change only, but the effects are very different. Like for the premium fruits, the high altitude fruits, the scarcity of snowfall is the main reason. But because of the snowfall and less rain, the water level is also going down. The rivers which were earlier giving like the opportunity of the agriculture and higher water levels, they are drying up. And because of that, the scarcity of water is very prominent. And like as a result, the fruits are shrinking in size because the fruits obviously need water to grow. And like in several cases, like because of the heat stroke, even the plants are drying up. They are entirely drying up and once they are dried, there is no more tree left to produce fruits. So yeah, like as I mentioned that the main reason is the climate change, but that is resulting in different forms and like resulting in both lesser yield and also a worse fruit quality. And in some cases, the pest and uh, these things are increasing. In some cases, it's decreasing because of the weather change. And at the same time, several pests and several insects are changing their properties. In several cases, like I was talking to a scientist, he said that ki, there were some pests which were earlier attacking different parts of the trees. Now they are attacking different parts. And like in some cases, some pests which were dominant for a very long time, they are getting recessive because of this sudden climate change. But at the same time, new diseases and new pests are also coming into picture. So it's not exactly an increase, but the things are changing. And because of that, we need to, you know, understand it better and kind of change uh, the things or the plants which we used to make for a better yield. You had the opportunity of talking to some fruit farmers in Nainital and in Uttarakhand as a whole. And these are farmers who have been doing this for generations. So what did they have to say about this situation? Yeah, as you rightly mentioned, like in Uttarakhand, there have been several belts, like uh, the Ramgad area is known as the fruit belt of Uttarakhand. Then there is Uttarkashi, where a large number of uh, farmers are growing apples. But because of the lesser yield, the farmers who have been involved in this for generations, they are losing interest. The new generation is not that much interested. And because of that, that is exactly what is reflected in the numbers. For some fruits, the area under cultivation has dropped to like more than 70%, which is a big number, which is like two third of the entire uh, area. And because of that, the farmers are not earning enough money. And that is why they are shifting to other things. At several locations, we saw that the farms which were used for fruit production for many years, like decades, they are either selling the land or changing the land use or they are making hotels and these things. And at the same time, if you talk about Ramgad specifically, so I went there and I mentioned like water is a big issue. In several cases, we saw like a lot of things are changing. So this year was the first time ever in the history of Ramgad when water tankers were used to ferry water to houses. And at the same time, the big hotels and resorts, there have swimming pools and using thousands of liter water uh, every week. So because of that thing, people are losing interest in this. And I was also talking to some scientists and they said that the problem is real. And if this keeps going on, then in the coming decade or so, we can see that this fruit belt of Uttarakhand might lose its significance. And Avnish, has the government made any efforts to elevate the situation? What I can see so far is that the main issue is that the people are not as much aware about the new technologies and the changes in this field as much as they should be. For example, if we talk about this, like apples, we said that snowfall is something which is very mandatory for the apple farming. In the recent time, there have been some low snow varieties of apples. But the problem is that only the large scale farmers are aware about this. So yeah, the government needs to kind of reach to the people and educate them about the new technologies and the new research coming in this field and that is precisely what the government has been planning and the local you know universities like the gb pandagan university is uh, like involved in this thing and they are continuously trying to reach people through whatsapp groups or uh, like uh, daily bulletins and everything so i talked to the pune imd and uh, i was talking to a scientist over there and he told me that every day based on the weather patterns they send bulletins to the either directly to the farmers or the local bodies like the local university or the district horticulture officers 
and they sent regular bulletins to them and from there they assess the weather patterns and based on that they release some suggestions that what should they do when to seed a particular plant or like what pesticides or what things to use so these are the bulletins which are issued but the problem is not in releasing the bulletin but it's reached to the last mile and that is something which uh, the government is kind of trying to do but at the same time that is reflected in the numbers that they are not as much successful as they should be but that is something which the government is focusing on right now and in the end we give an update on the neat ug case The Central Bureau of Investigation yesterday arrested one of the alleged kingpins of the NEET UG paper leak case from the outskirts of Patna according to a source. Nalanda resident Rakesh Rajan alias Rocky was produced before the special court in Patna which remanded him in 10 days of CBI custody. Rocky who was on the CBI's radar for days had been absconding and changing hideouts frequently after the crackdown was started on irregularities in the entrance exam. The source said Quote, the accused identified as Rakesh Rajan alias Rocky who hails from Nalanda is said to be a relative of mastermind Sanjeev Mukhia was arrested by the CBI from the outskirts of Patna the CBI has been trailing him since the case came to the agency and he was changing his hideouts frequently with the help of technical surveillance the CBI found his exact location and arrested him in the early morning unquote After his arrest four CBI teams conducted searches at four locations linked to Rajan in Patna nearby areas and one in Kolkata The source also informed that earlier this week the CBI had conducted searches at 15 locations in Bihar and Jharkhand from where they found incriminating evidence in the case The agency had earlier arrested the principal and vice principal of Jharkhand's Hazira Bagh based Oasis School in connection with the case and two people who allegedly had lent the premises to neat candidates where burnt question papers were recovered by the Bihar police. The CBI which is probing the alleged irregularities in the medical entrance exam has registered 6 FIRs in the matter so far. You were listening to 3 things by the Indian Express. Today's show was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar and produced by me Niharika Nanda. If you like the show then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can also tweet us at Express Audio and write to us at podcasts at indianexpress.com. 